Yeah, but um, you know what? It, um, it actually works well to, in my, in my own experience, to go to the authorities and, and work with the authorities. You know, there's a really wonderful family that I know from South Carolina. They're, they're all Caucasians, but every generation since the late 1800s was born in Korea. Back when Korea had a king, it was a United Kingdom. And it can, that continued even after the war. And the gentleman that's now the current, if you will, patriarch of the family, he decided he didn't want to be a missionary, so he went into, he became a general contractor in building houses in South Carolina. And I think, you know, one day the Lord tapped on his shoulder and he decided go up to Washington, or go up to New York, I'm sorry, go to the, um, the Korean mission to the UN, and um, spoke to them. And of course, you know, obviously you have to give them something. <laughs> so they allowed him to come to Korea as a missionary. He could only go <coughs> to cities that were below a certain size, for obvious reasons. You know what they're trying to do. And he had to be doing something they wanted. So they have started, like so many communist countries, they tried to start in hospitals that they couldn't finish, schools that they couldn't finish, and because he was in construction. So he has to buy the material himself, import the material, pay the North Korean government a tariff for importing the material. They'll finish the construction they started, and then they allow him to now, it's better to do it that way because you can't be arrested if you have an official permission of the government. So, you know, but I realize in some situations you can't. You don't have much of a choice, especially in Muslim countries. Anyway, let's go ahead and start and um, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, Father. Thank you. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you love and care and provision for us, Lord. You have been so good to us in this country. You have blessed us, given us resources like no other country in the history of mankind. Help us, Lord, to recognize that you gave us this for a reason, and that we are to go out there and share your blessings with the ones you love and care for. Give us that Salary, which is a little under 60 million, 
So for him to give away six billion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, six billion is nothing. So there is no sacrifice in him giving away six billion. You see, the key word here is sacrifice. How much does it hurt you to do that? And I'm not saying you need to hemorrhage to death. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there needs to be some hurt in it. Otherwise, it's not a sacrifice. Think about it with your wife, when you were putting your wife. Did you want her to think that you were the last of the great big spenders? Because you were making a sacrifice. So that's what giving, that means in the New Testament era. Did you notice that Jesus never, never instituted tithing? and making Saturday the Sabbath day. He repeated all the commandments. He never said, you've got to put in 10%. He never said, he never gave a percentage. Why is that? Because he knew of Elon Musk. He knew of Bill Gates. 10% means nothing to some people. It's moved as the Holy Spirit moves your heart. Not as Gordon tells you, but as the Holy Spirit your heart. And that's why you find I always invite the missionaries to come down. So he'll be here a little bit later. We're going to go on. Uh, we were on page, let me go back. We were on page 48. Uh, we're going to be stopped for some mirth and merriment. Thank you to the volunteers. Um, <coughs> uh, that's, uh, we were at uh, about one quarter of the way down the page. So we're at Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Oh, I'm sorry, that's page 48. I'm sorry, page 48. And, and it says, And out of the throne, this is the throne of God, proceed lightnings and thunders and voices. Now, uh, understand the verse before that read, when he said, And around about the throne, this is the throne of God, were four uh, uh, and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw over <coughs> many elders sitting, and clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So we talk a little bit about who were these people. And I said to you that um, you're not you're not gonna understand everything about these 24 elders at this point, but later on as we go along in Revelation, you'll see more things about them. They basically are doing several, well, four things. Item number one is that they're sitting in the presence of God. They are around the throne. They're sitting in the presence of God. Remember I talked to you last week about your father, your earthly father, this being part of his name, and your heavenly father wants to hear your voice, wants to stand <coughs> you. Your earthly father want you for your presence. Your husband does want you for your presence, but he also wants you for this other presence. So, we're, he's not like the husband. The earthly father is much better. And I said to you, the second thing that they are, the, the elders are doing is that they comfort and provide assurance. Why? Because John was a pastor of a church's seven churches that were undergoing constant persecution by the Roman Empire. They, they felt like, you know, God, where are you? I mean, this shouldn't be happening to us because we're doing what you asked us to do. And so they are assuring John so John can assure the, uh, the saints that don't worry about what's happening to you right now. Things are going to change. And they uh, they spark spiritual discussion. You'll see that a little later on in, 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 in Revelation, where they ask John, um, uh, you know, uh, they ask John, um, uh, they put a question to him and says, what does this mean, all the people that are under the altar? Yes, and, um, and of course, the last thing that they did is that they sang a new song. Okay, so, 
We're now at in, in verse 5, and he says, And out of the throng proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. When you see uh, things like this, you know, obviously, keep in mind that these are dark days. And so these are just things to assure John's audience, John's congregations, that God is in control. He controls the lightning. He controls the light. You know, he's not, you know, he can dissipate the darkness. The same way light overcomes darkness. Darkness never overcomes light. And so he's going on, he says, don't worry, a storm is coming to the pagans once it refused to believe. When I said to you, you know, uh, uh, some time ago, I said, there's only one part of sin, and that is the sin where you say, I don't want to trust my life in Jesus because I want to do what I want to do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to be the master of my own life. And you go to your grave refusing to submit to Jesus Christ. That is the end part of the sin. You know, um, non Christians that I speak to tend to think that murder is the end part of the sin. No. Murder is not a problem for, for God. He can resurrect the dead. Remember that? So that's not a problem. And Christians, on the other hand, tend to be more concerned about things like uh, homosexuality or uh, adultery. No, homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. Neither is adultery. I don't recommend you try either, but not, none of them are unpardonable. You know, um, and. Before, I'm sorry, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This refers to a, 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 a chapter in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, in which, um, I'm trying to know where did I put it on, yes. You're probably familiar with this chapter. Oh, here comes up, Pastor Ron. But let me uh, read this, this chapter from Isaiah for you. It says, and the spirit of the Lord, which is in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh, shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He's referring to the seven functions of the Holy Spirit. And I'll go through that with you after. We have a Mr. Bogdan on the service for, for, uh, uh, for service for those of you that attended. Thank you for letting us uh, interrupt you for just a moment. Not at all. I, this class and I have very strong feelings about supporting missionaries. So good, good. Well, we, we are only going to be here five minutes, and we're only going to be as long as you have a question. If you don't have a question, we're leaving. Yes? Move over here, sir. You're in the light. Under the light. You want to under the light. Oh, under the light. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, what questions do you have? I think one of the things that I came into my mind is, uh, is the ministry that you're doing uh, for children and children in what age range? So it starts from preschool age, like four, it will uh -huh. be the smallest, and then until 25, 26, oh. depends. And then mothers who ended up in crisis and families who struggled because of mostly alcohol and drugs addictions, um, then we're also serving them, trying to help their kids firstly and then them. Oh, so it's kind of like a combination of our ministry here with children that deals with that wide range, plus like mops, and, you know, which is uh, uh, mothers of preschool children. We have a ministry for just for the mothers. Yes. Yeah. So yes. it's a combination of things that we do here. Yeah, uh, we're, already, sorry, we're already doing this ministry, me particularly, Doing this ministry 22 years. Wow. And as we grow little by little, we came to the point where we need to stretch the ministry because we want to cover all the uh, stages of the kids growing up because we want to break this cycle of hopelessness. Right. Because we see that orphans reduce orphans. The crisis families, kids from crisis families, reduce crisis, crisis families. Children. And it's never ended up. But if God will interrupt and broke this cycle of hopelessness, then all generations will be changed. Okay, next question. 
Yes. Can you give like a like a one paragraph summary? I haven't heard your your spiel yet. Oh well, I mean, she wasn't there. Yeah, she wasn't there. Yeah, well, let's not repeat that because he's just already a, done that. Just a one paragraph. He, he's dealing with 450 young children, so he has those under his uh, care, and he's got about 12 sites throughout Ukraine that's that's connected with his ministry. Okay. Okay. There you go. And he's in Ukraine. He hasn't left Ukraine. I'd like to know if some of the children or adults come from Russia, or are they in just in Ukraine? Those who went to Russia, they not coming back. Uh, though uh, lots of Russians taken a lot of kids, like orphanages, institutions, they bring them to Russia. And right now there are a lot of people like strong believers working hard with the government to bring them back. We already, Ukraine already brought back 350 kids from Russia, and there are a lot more. Hmm. What they're playing for often, what are asking, or trying to put them in the office? Uh, for adoption? Yeah, so what do we do? What's the end goal to make them back in office? Yeah, um, our strongest desire is each kid's uh, growing up in the family. And uh, we do our best. Right now, as never before, because in Ukraine we have a, probably you read this news, we have a huge draft right now, and a lot of men don't have a choice at all. So I can make a uh, <laughs> like truth for you uh, that right now in Kiev, only Kiev is the capital of Ukraine, it's like on two and a half year long to wait to adopt, ind ind indigenous adoption, not the foreigner adoption. Because adoption allows you to not go to the war. From one perspective, it's a, it's a big help right now, but from other perspective, we know how all those, not all, I hope, uh, uh, some of those adoptions could end up. Because a lot of people doing this with the wrong uh, purpose. Yeah, or the wow, and we had not heard that. But we hoping that churches right now, uh, recently two of our, our team members adopted kids, not because they don't want to go to uh, war, but because they have hearts for those kids. They adopted and we, and we pray strongly for the churches to step up and adopt, like in the first line. I understand that Russia is taking young children, very young children, out of the Ukraine, bringing them to Russia putting them into Russian families and basically acculturating them, ch changing their culture. Yeah. Both uh, Russian families and orphanages. Yes, both, <coughs> yes. That, that's what I've read. There might be two big questions there, but with that, um, it, what do you see happening with the that kind of thing? I mean, it's outside of Putin and the, the government, um, what do you see as the effects of something like that of a kid growing up in Russia versus a kid growing up in Ukraine? Um, as soon as the kids will end up in Russia, this propaganda that exists from both sides, of course, of course, but this propaganda will make them to hate Ukraine. Because right now they mention us that we are in evil that we are bad, that they need to fight against evil and uh, let Ukrainian uh, people be free, especially uh, Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians. Ukrainians. Yes. But it's all false, because my native town, Chernihiv, north of Kyiv, Kyiv and most part of uh, Ru uh, Ukraine usually speaks Russian. But since the invasion, we working hard, even though it's not easy, to fully Switch to Ukraine. Yeah. So, yeah. The children that are taken, are they taken from orphanages? Are they shot in the street and are kidnapped? How does uh, mainly from the orphanages, but there was cases when, uh, because of war, it's a lot of um, panic, and a lot of a um, lot of a lot of uh, parents with kids were separated because of evacuation, for example. And they ended up in Russia, and parents ended up in Ukraine, and it's also happening even now. 
this uh, Russian still coming into Ukraine. Like they already taking 20% and each day it's like a small cut. They little by little they taking our territories, unfortunately. One more question. Are we done? Mm -hmm. Okay. You didn't, have, you didn't have the church support you. Know, right? This church puts ten percent of its of its receipts into missions. Plus, on top of that, people can uh, donate money to specific ministries, and that is added on to the ten percent, which yeah. Pastor Ron knows all about that. And so yeah. we are very mission oriented church, and uh, you know I think everyone. And if you want to support him, just put Ukraine. Don't put his name, but just put Ukraine on your check or on the envelope, and it will get to him directly. I, I have a question that's not related to how, how much uh, control does Biden have on what's going on in Ukraine? Unfortunately, they cannot <coughs> answer this question because I don't know. But uh, I see that we depend a lot from our um, friends from. The U.S. Yeah, because otherwise, Russians will take us for them. Good answer. Okay. All right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for all your prayers and support. Thank you for letting us interrupt you. Not Thank at you. all. Not at all, Pastor. As I said, war is about rich old man sending poor young men to die. That's not our king. Our king came to this earth to die for us. He didn't send us to die for him. That is the difference. And it's important you understand that difference. So I, I mentioned to you, it says here in, uh, in uh, verse uh, um, 4 5, uh, it says, which uh, it says, and there were seven lamps burning before the throne, seven lamps of fire. And these are the seven spirits of God. Now, before you get all carry there and think there are seven holy spirits. That's not what he's saying here. That's not what he's saying. Um, in fact, um, just to make Jennifer feel better, I'm revamping my entire study on the uh, Holy Spirit. I, I literally tossed off what I had before and rewriting it. <laughs> so I hope you feel better. Uh, now, what he's talking about here is the seven functions of the Holy Spirit. Not seven Holy Spirits, the seven functions of the Holy Spirit. And it's elucidated in Isaiah. If you count with me, you will see this. Now understand, in the Hebrew, where it, where it says Lord, it, the Hebrew is the Tetragrammaton. You know, Y-H, the H. And that's just, um, the ancient uh, scribes, uh, uh, Jewish scribes, did not spell out the name of God. They, they took the vowels out and left the consonants in. So we really don't know what is the correct pronunciation of, of the name of, of God was given to Moses. Uh, they did that because they considered the name of God to be holy, so they did not want anybody and everybody just uh, uh, repeating it. So um, when you hear me say the word Lord, um, it is actually the word Yahweh in, in the Hebrew. So let's turn again and count with me. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Holy Spirit will come, not in him, but remember I explained you the difference? Upon him, dominate him. The spirit of wisdom and truth. Wisdom and truth. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now you see it. Seven functions of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and um, going on, hang on a second. Yes. Oh, we got six. No, come again. <laughs> I'm going to do it with you. The Spirit of the Lord, one. The Spirit of wisdom, two. The Spirit of truth, three. The Spirit of counsel, four. The Spirit of might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. There are seven. I'm knowledge, sure of that. Knowledge, 
<laughs> the fear of the knowledge of the Lord. It's not the knowledge, it's the fear. You remember <clears throat> Solomon said that the fear of the Lord is correct. Correct. Uh, so that, that actually counts as one. It's not fear and knowledge, it's fear of the knowledge of God. Um, Can you and, say that uh, one more time? Just like sure, that. sure. The Spirit of the Lord, one. He says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's number one. The Spirit of wisdom, two. The Spirit of truth, because it's wisdom and truth, three. The Spirit of counsel. What did Solomon say? In many councils, there's wisdom. You got to, that's why uh, the king and the president is surrounded by many councils. And might. Four. Uh, two, three. Uh, yeah, five. no, that's fine. That's fine, yes. The spirit of knowledge, six. And the fear of the Lord, seven. But is the spirit of the Lord a title? Um, no, uh, but because it's the rest of the sentence. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. It doesn't give, um, if you look at the others, there is no uh, verb and there is no object. It's all subject. Look at it. The Spirit of the Lord, subject, shall rest, verb, upon him. Preposition and object. The next one is, that's, so that's one. The next one is the Spirit of wisdom and truth. No bird, no object. Now you see what I'm doing? Okay. Um, now, Bruce, you should know, you've known me a long time. You know you should never argue with a glass school about English. This person is just troubled because I always don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah, well, because I, I look at the structure of the sentence. And he just. Um, and, uh, okay. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. Now, I have real problems imagining what this must be like. This sounds like an incredible sight. A sea that is not made of water, but it's made of glass. And the glass is crystal clear. Um, I would love to see this, because I cannot wrap, I cannot totally wrap my brain around it. I, I mean, I think I have an idea of it, but I, Pretty sure my idea is paltry compared to the reality. <coughs> well, uh, yes, go ahead. A little issue about glass mm -hmm. is that properly formulated, it does what it's intended to do Correct. in dispersion of light, of light, which scripture in my judgment tells us that's wisdom. Yes, yes, it, it is. And and for the believer, he has God's promise that that spread out before him is his for grasping and for usage of what God has intended to do. Yeah, it, it's funny you said that it, 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 it does what it was intended to do. You and I both dealt with the, the, dealing with convexity and concavity, what it does to life. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Dave, uh, specialty was optics, and uh, he made lenses for uh, things like telescopes and things like that. So he's very knowledgeable about glass and light and refraction and the, the light spectrum. So, uh, and you know, that's part of uh, that's basically like physics one twenty. And it's, it, it's very true. Glass does wonderful things with light. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just let the light go through it. It can actually break the light up into uh, into its different colors. Uh, yes. Go is ahead. it possible that when he talks about the sea of glass, uh -huh. that maybe there is a certain amount of water, but like if you I, look at us, yes. If yes. you go to a a pool yes. that's super pristinely clean and quiet, the surface is quiet. And quiet. Yes. Um, it's often called 
it's, it's the glass as is clear as glass. I have the same thoughts that you have. I, I, I think that um, a certain part of it has to be liquid. Whether it's water, I'm not sure. But I think a certain part of it has to be liquid. I don't think that even with that addition that I have a complete view of what uh, John saw, what he's trying to describe to us. Um, now, one of the things I want you to notice is when you get to heaven, the first thing you see is the throne, the one who sits on the throne, and the glassy seat, the crystal seat that's around it. I, I find that very, very interesting because it gives you awe and an impression of incredible majesty. <coughs> Very much like the Americans. 
you know, get to the point, get to the point. I mean, you know, like, you know, cut the ceremony, you know. Um, and so uh, Mark presents Jesus as a servant. Jesus came to serve. The symbol that uh, we see Jesus as a king, that is symbolized by a lion. Mark presents him as a servant that is symbolized by an ox. Remember I said to you that, remember an ox in, the, in, that, uh, in an agricultural society at that time was basically a John Deere. It's a John Deere tractor, that's what it is. Uh. Yeah, you know, and um, it just didn't have the brand name on it, but that's what it was. Uh, Luke presents Jesus in his humanity because Luke was Greek. And the Greeks worship him. You know, people say, uh, I don't have any idols. I'm like, I'm sure the answer is, well, your first idol is, you know. You have know, you heard people say, well, the God I serve would never send a murderer to the death center, dead chief. And the God I serve, you know, he would say, let the poor people steal. And the God I serve, but which God are you talking about? You are manufacturing a God in your own likeness. So we do break the second commandment all the time. We just don't realize it. Uh, and of course, John presents Jesus as the Son of God, as the divinity, as deity. And he's pictured by the eagle. The eagle is an interesting animal. First of all, the eagles mate once. They have one mate for life. And when their mate dies, they never mate with anyone else. That sounds like our God. The eagle is the only creature on the earth that is capable of looking directly into the sun not being blinded by it. The eagle? The eagle? The eagle. Wow. The eagle. It has an extra um, eyelid on the inside that uh, even when its, its outer lids are open, that lid can come down when they look into the sun. Um, and also, uh, they can fly higher than any other eagle. So you see how, I mean, their nests are at least 10 stories off the ground, uh, in a tree, of course. So. Um, they soar higher than any other uh, 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 creature on Earth. One of the other theories as to why these four creatures had all these different faces, um, some said you know, the face of a man, because man was, uh, was the, the pinnacle of creation, the greatest creation. The face of a lion, because the lion was the greatest wild animal, the king of the jungle. The face of an ox, because the ox is the greatest domesticated animal, not the greatest wild, the greatest domesticated animal. And the face of an eagle, because the eagle is the face of the greatest flying creature on earth. They still are. That's why so many nations have had eagles as their symbol, as a national symbol. Tsarist Russia, Nazi Germany. United States. I'm not putting anybody together. I'm just telling you that it's a favorite symbol. Uh, in, I, I take you back, I think it's to, um, uh, I'm trying to think what, uh, I think it was in Deuteronomy. Uh, hang on, let me look. Uh, numbers, I'm sorry, the numbers. God tells them, tells the Israelites that they are to be in a certain order. Not the other tribes in here. 
Judah, Benjamin, I uh, think it was uh, Israel, had 186,000 men. And remember, in those days, the census referred only to men, not to women, not to children. Uh, Dan, the, 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 the symbol for Dan was the eagle. The symbol for Judah was the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Reuben, the one that kept in the period of this one of his concubine, has the symbol of a man. And Ephraim, the symbol of the servant, ox. Remember, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh were big men uh, ranching cattle, uh, especially in Manasseh. Well, this is, uh, and they were to be arranged in the shape of a cross. Because God said, put this one on the left, these three on the left, uh, on the east, I'm sorry, God actually said east. This one on the, on the north, this one on the, on the west, and this one on the south. And they all surround Levi. And they were to march in this order. And you know that this wasn't an accident. It happens to look like a cross. When Balaam was hired by Balak to curse, uh, read me out of that time. It's not uh, how rude, really. He tried to curse the Israelites. He was on a mountain, and he looked down, and what he saw was the sign of the cross. You see, Balaam thought that because the Israelites had done a lot of you know, bad things, they did, uh, did, uh, you know, worship the golden calf and all of that, and they danced naked and stuff like that, that God would be angry with them permanently and knew nothing about the forgiveness of God. He didn't. When he saw the cross, the only thing that came out of his mouth were blessings, not curses. So, um, you know, I think that the four faces that you see on the cherubim relates to this. I think it does relate to the gospel. I think all these are valid theories. I'm giving you all the different theories out there. Um, I think they do refer to the orders of creation, you know, man being the greatest creation. Um, you can pick whichever one you like. <laughs> I believe they're all valid, to be honest with you. Um, to stop here, uh, yes? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, why were those penetrating? I presume that it was because uh, you were not to look upon um, the mercy seat. Remember, the, the, the key aspect of the mercy seat was, I'm uh, sorry, the key aspect of the ark was the mercy seat on top of the ark. I know people worry about what was in the ark, and it was just uh, the, ten, the two tablets of uh, the Ten Commandments and uh, Aaron's rod, but uh, that's the that's what's inside. But on top of the ark was the mercy seat. And that's where the high priest met with God once a year for the forgiveness of the sins of the nation. Amen? So I think God was basically saying, you're not to look into our, uh, in, uh, you, you're not to look in, in, into God's reasons for his mercy and his grace. And I think that. I think that's what it was being said because you're right, a lot of the people who attempted to do that were killed. Uh, so only the Levites should try to touch the uh, ark. And, uh, you know, a gentleman was killed who did the exact opposite, uh, an Israelite. And of course, the Philistines got in trouble <laughs> because they attempted to do things with him. So the answer to your question is, um, uh, I don't have an exact reason, but I think God meant for only the high priest to have access to that. And with him, once a year. And I think that's because it was a symbol of what was to come. The real high priest, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was going to come. And he could be, he could sit on the mercy seat and dispense mercy and grace. Nobody else was supposed to do that or even to look into it. And I think I think that's the reason for that. That's Gordon's theory. Uh, now, oh, let me go. Uh, I don't I have to make a note of this later. I didn't bring my pen with me. Um, uh, 
what's happening? Uh, well, first of all, um, the, um, the Parliament of Israel uh, approved the request from the War Cabinet to call up 385,000 reservists. That's a lot of people for a small nation. And um, uh, they are obviously, uh, most of, I, I think, from like 285,000 of those reservists of uh, training in the north of Israel. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the north of Israel because all of the actions in the south, where Gaza is, but uh, Hezbollah has been sending over rockets, uh, anti-tank missiles, and drones, uh, anywhere from 20 a day to up to 300 a day, depending on who got killed recently. Like, you know, right after that uh, Iranian uh, general got killed, they sent over some 300 rockets per day. That is per day. Uh, the amount of money that, um, that they have spent on, uh, on the rockets that are sent over could feed the entire population of Gaza and the, and the West Bank for two years. Yeah, that, that's how much they're wasting. That's feeding five million people for two years. <coughs> so it is obvious that Israel has to do something about Hezbollah. First of all, there's 100,000 Israeli farmers who, of, of the people who, been, who lived in the north near the border and who had to be evacuated because of the constant barrage of, of rockets coming over. And so that sector of the economy is dead. No country can tolerate that forever. Secondly, you know, um, obviously some of these people who have to live with relatives, but those that don't have relatives, governments pay for them in hotels. And so they're going to have to do something about Hezbollah. Hezbollah has, uh, has changed their headbands from green, which, by the way, uh, was Allah's favorite color because it was Mohammed's favorite color. Yeah, talk about making God in your own life. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Hezbollah has changed their headbands from green to red. Red it is, means that they're going to war with them. Uh, and Israel has been performing maneuvers in northern Israel and southern Israel, ground maneuvers. They are planning, uh, there's no question that they're planning an invasion deep into Lebanon, probably north of Beirut. In other words, I think they are ready to uh, do to Hezbollah what they did to, uh, to uh, Hamas. Hamas, yes, in Gaza. The, the situation in, in Gaza is wrapping up. Uh, they have control of more than half of Rafa, and uh, I don't think it will take them very long. They've already eliminated one of the four remaining battalions of uh, Hamas in Rafa, and the other three are in disarray. Uh, yeah, so we are probably looking at, at, at some sort of an increase. Uh, our current administration, again, has propensity for making what I call spiritual mistakes, uh, uh, has decided that yesterday was one of the made-up feasts of uh, Islam. <coughs> Muhammad said that yesterday was this feast of sacrifice. I have no idea what that means. Uh, and uh, apparently it's a big holiday in, in the Muslim world. And, uh, our administration has insisted that yesterday Israel imposed a temporary ceasefire for, I think it's 11 hours a day, every day for the next, I forget, I think 11 days or something like that. It has to do with supposedly just to commemorate the 11 Israeli soldiers that were killed in the last five days. So I think five or eight. Eight of them, eight of them were killed. In, in, they were inside the uh, armored personnel carrier, and they were killed because it was hit by a rocket. Uh, supposedly, the reason that we're having this temporary daily ceasefire uh, from eight in the morning till seven at night is because of um, uh, to uh, to commemorate the death of the of, of these eleven uh, soldiers, but also to honor the feast of um, of sacrifice. I find it interesting that he's very concerned about celebrating an artificial place <coughs> made up by Muhammad. Uh, 
but he's not concerned that Hamas attacked Israel on a holy day. And every holy day since then, they have attacked uh, Israel with hundreds of rockets. So I think, though, that um, you should expect sometime before uh, September, Israel will invade uh, Hezbollah and take it all the way to the Gulf of Beirut, because that's where um, uh, Hezbollah headquarters are. Thank you, young man. I'm glad one of us pays attention to the clock. Uh, anyway, uh, we are, we're going to end there, and uh, if you have uh, any questions, you can always talk to me naturally. We are living in perilous times, as I said to you before, I believe we are living in the days of Ezekiel chapter 38. We are. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that comes from your word. You have told us what would happen in advance. You have prepared us for this. And that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem to come and to come soon. You will come soon. Help us, Lord, with the time that you what we have left, the time that you have given us. We have no idea how long that is, but we are going to take the gospel to everyone you bring across our path to share it any way we can sharing the word through love, through service. Help us, Lord, to be your arms, legs, your voice in this world. The world that's done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we're well, nice to see you, young man. And never mind that you're welcome here, too, not just when you go away.